So a couple months ago, I helped build this game called CryptoKitties. And CryptoKitties are these collectible, breedable, and adorable digital cats. You can see a couple of them up on the slide. Every cat has its own special DNA that determines how it looks. And since there are billions of different possible DNA combinations, every cat is unique. So the fun in the game comes from exploring the genetic system, breeding new cats, making cool looking cats, and finding new traits that nobody else has found before. And it turns out the internet is a pretty big fan of cats. So this game kind of took off more quickly than we were thinking. To give you a sense, about a week after we launched, CryptoKitties was using 25% of all the traffic on the platform we built on. And, um, and today, just about $20 million has been spent on these cats. For a while, we were seeing articles like these just about every day. It was pretty crazy. This guy even sold, this guy's name is Genesis, uh, this cat. And it sold for over $100,000. And you're, <laughs> I'm sure you think to yourself, that's crazy, right? Why on earth would somebody spend all that money on a picture of a cat? Seriously. But maybe it's not so crazy, or at least as crazy as some other things that we spend money on. This is the Salvatore Mundi. Uh, it's a painting by Leonardo da Vinci. It's not, not quite as famous as the Mona Lisa, but it's still pretty good. Uh, and it recently sold at auction for this crazy amount, $400 million. It broke the record. And that's interesting because anybody who wants to can go online, look at this painting for free. Nobody's going to stop you. If you want, you can print out a copy, stick it in a frame, and put it up on your wall, right? So why did this person spend all this money? And it's because there's only one of these things, right? There's only one painting. And the owner of that one physical object has these special permissions. They can put it up on their wall, they can donate it to a museum, they can sell it. We deal with these kinds of physical objects all the time. So this is intuitive to us. We understand what it means to hold a physical object and to own it. But with the case of digital things, and I'm going to talk about CryptoKitties specifically here, there is no physical thing to hold in your hand. It's just something that appears on a screen. And our natural understanding of digital objects is kind of colored by the fact that they're so easy to copy and that there's an abundance of them, it seems. So it may seem strange to claim that it's even possible to own something that's just a digital thing. But hear me out. So in CryptoKitties, we have these rules that say only one person and own a cat at a time. No surprise there, right? And the owner of that cat has special permissions. Just like the painting, they can sell it, they can give it away, they can trade it. And unlike the painting, they can participate in the mechanics of the game if they own the cat. They can breed the cats together, try to find cool looking cats, explore the genetic system, like I was talking about earlier. So despite there being no physical object, you can still have these same kind of properties of ownership. But there's a problem with digital ownership that doesn't really exist in the same way with physical ownership. And it has to do with these rules that say who can own what, and so on. Since these rules are written in software, they're almost endlessly flexible. You can do just about anything you want. And for the most part, that's really good. It means that you can, say, make a game about breeding cats. But it also means that these rules are changeable. So you as people and anybody who participates in these systems have to kind of trust the people who are writing the software, making the rules, maintaining these things. You have to trust that they'll be fair, competent, and reliable. And most of the time, they will be, right? But there's often no recourse when they aren't. Um, and it's, it's really important that digital ownership systems are robust. It probably doesn't seem like the end of the world if you lose a cat in CryptoKitties, maybe unless you lose the one that was selling for $100,000. But it definitely is if you lose all your money or your retirement investments. And more and more these kinds of things, and more and more things in general, 
are stored digitally. I bet a lot more of your money is stored in your bank's computer system than you have lying around in cash. So that's why with CryptoKitties, we wanted to kind of tackle this problem of digital ownership head on, which was why we used this technology called blockchain. And if you're internet, into uh, technology, I'm sure you've heard all this hype about blockchain in the news recently. But really what it does is it lets you track and transfer ownership of digital stuff without having to rely on some trusted third party. And that's a little bit dense, so let me unpack it a bit. The digital stuff can be just about anything. It can be money, it can be stocks in a company, it can be property rights, or it can be cats. And the fact that you don't have to rely on a third party means that you as the person who owns this stuff has more authority over the things that you own. And also means you can reduce costs, you can cut out middlemen, and you can minimize the kind of failures that happen when these trusted third parties either make a mistake or have a problem. Maybe their server goes down. And you might be wondering how this stuff all works. And it's a little bit complicated, and there's a lot of math. So I'm going to give you the blockchain 101 version. Um, I like to think of it as a book. So suppose everybody gets a copy of this book, and all the copies stay in sync with each other. Anytime you want, you can write something down in this book, but once you write it, it's there for good. You can't go back and change it. You can't go back and erase it or scribble over it. Once it's there, it's there. And every time you write something down, you sign your name. And that lets everybody else know who wrote down which thing in the book. So we know who wrote down everything in the book because they signed their name. And we also know that they can never go back and change it. And that allows people who are using this book to kind of make promises by writing things down. Promises that other people can trust. Because you can always go back and say, hey, you wrote this down. And what this allows us to do is make a universally trusted record-keeping system. And that's really what a blockchain is. It's just a way to keep records, keep things that you write down that everybody can trust. And it might not be clear why this blockchain thing has anything to do with CryptoKitties. So let me, let me explain that a little bit. There are basically two ways that CryptoKitties uses blockchain to make it better than other games, or at least different from other games. And the first is that all the rules of the game are written down on this blockchain thing, written down in this book. And that means two things. First of all, anybody who wants to play the game, before they even get started, they can read through the rules, make sure they're fair, make sure they agree, make sure there are no loopholes. And it also means that since these rules are written down on this thing that can't be changed, everybody can be assured that the rules aren't going to change in the future. And that's sort of valuable with CryptoKitties, but it's more valuable for other things, like maybe you make a legal agreement or something like that. And the other way that CryptoKitties is different from other games is since all these rules and since all the records of ownership, who owns which cat and when, is all stored on this blockchain thing that's separate from the people who made the game, even if we were to just completely disappear, we as the people who made this game, everybody who owns a cat would still be able to play the game. They could still transfer their cats around, breed them, just by interacting with the blockchain directly. So there's a separation between the people who build systems or build games and the actual thing itself. And of course, we weren't the first person to use blockchain. I'm sure you guys have all heard of Bitcoin. It's been all over the news recently. And it's actually been around for quite a long time. It's been around for 10 years. And it was one of the first um, systems or applications that used this blockchain thing. And that makes it kind of simple. What you can do is you can send Bitcoin, and you can receive Bitcoin, and that's it. It's really not that exciting. But in the meantime, more and more flexible and capable blockchain applications have been developed. The one that we use for CryptoKitties is called Ethereum. And the big difference here is that systems like Ethereum let you create any kind of rules that you can imagine and track and transfer ownership 
of anything using this trustless blockchain system. So let me give you two examples of how that can be useful. First is shareholder voting. So how many people own any kind of shares or stocks in a company? Probably not too many because we're students, but I'm sure some of you do. But basically, companies have shares, you own shares in a company, and you get to vote, um, usually based on how many shares you have. And if you own a couple shares, it's often not really worth your time to actually vote because you have to you know, fill out a form or fax somebody, God forbid. But if companies were to store this stuff on a decentralized blockchain system, shareholders would be able to vote pretty much instantly from anywhere. Just tap a couple buttons on your phone. And the voting rights and maybe dividend rights or whatever else associated with these shares would be transferred automatically and transparently whenever you bought and sold shares in a company. And this would make these kinds of companies more democratic and accessible to people. Because even if you don't own a massive stake in a company, maybe you just own a couple shares, you can still participate in its governance. And another example is supply chain tracking. So right now you walk into a store, you buy something, maybe it says made in China or whatever on a tag. We don't really know what went into making that thing. But imagine if all the links along the supply chain were visible and accessible and stored somewhere so you could actually see where the things that you bought came from. Um, this would allow you and consumers to see the provenance of the things that you bought all the way from the raw material to the finished good. And it would allow you to understand the impacts of purchases and make choices to only support companies that align with your values or only support companies that have ethical manufacturing procedures. If these kinds of things were stored on a blockchain, they would be trustworthy and reliable in a way that just storing them in a regular old database isn't. So both of these two examples just rely on fairly subtle changes in how we do record keeping. And I mentioned record keeping a couple times. And really, record keeping is not that exciting. It's kind of boring. But it's fundamental to almost everything that we do. And in the same way that the move from paper record keeping to computerized record keeping made it faster and easier to store massive amounts of data, blockchain has the capacity to make it more accessible, reliable, and transparent for people. So I'm hoping that cats are just the beginning. Thank you.